Hi folks, it's Sarah here and today I am here to talk about one of my favorite independent publishers, Tin House. Tin House started out as a literary magazine. They started in 1999 and though they don't print the magazine anymore, they do now publish books and they publish about 12 books a year. They also partner with David Naiman on what is probably my favorite podcast of all time called Between the Covers. David Naiman interviews authors on that podcast. It's so smart and it's so inspirational for other writers and it really is what inspired me to come out into the world to talk about the books that I love. Um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with Tin House because they get so much praise, but I thought I would show you a, a stack of Tin House books from my collection here where I have it. I'm gonna try and grab it. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, I'm even gonna try to put those in size order. Wait, do I shake them over? So I'm gonna show each of these, but I am not gonna give a summary or talk about all of them. Instead, I thought I would focus on two books in particular by the same author and do a, more of a deep dive in those books. But first I'll show you what I got. So we have here, where should we start? Uh, Woo! <clears throat> We have here Divide Me by Zero, a novel by Lara Vapnyar. I've read another one of her books. I think it's called The Scent of Pine, which is was so good. It's got, oh, it's got crumbs on it. Oh, no. The Magical Language of Others, a memoir by E.J. Ko. E.J. Ko did an interview. <clears throat> I think I'm between the covers. Um, that was so great. There are these... I said I wasn't going to talk about the, these, but I had to show you this, the um, photocopies of letters from her mother, written in Korean. The Seas, a novel by Samantha Hunt. 99 Stories of God by Joy Williams. I love the dogs on the boat. Scorpion Fish, a novel by Natalie Bacopoulos. What Storm, What Thunder, a novel by Miriam J.A. Chauncey. All the Names Given, poems by Raymond Antrobus. Also an amazing interview on Between the Covers. I think, I think a lot of these have interviews on Between the Covers, which makes sense since they're all Tin House. Negotiations, poems by Destiny O. Birdsong. And there is a great interview with Destiny O. Birdsong on Versus, the um, poetry podcast with Denez Smith and Franny Choi. Another, they're no longer the hosts, but another amazing podcast. <clears throat> and then finally, the two books I'm gonna talk more extensively about today are, oops, no, not finally. I have one more. Oh my gosh, I'm missing a book. <clears throat> the Maker of Swans by Perrick O'Donnell. This is actually an advanced reader copy. This doesn't come out until June, 2022, but um, I have started it and it's, it's really interesting. Um, I can't wait to talk more about it. But the two books I'm going to talk more about uh, today are Costa Alegre by Courtney Mom, which is a novel, and her just published memoir. This is an advanced copy, but this was just published yesterday <laughs> when I'm filming this. This is The Year of the Horses, a memoir by Courtney Mom. But this is what we're going to be spending most of our time with today. As you can see, I have lots of notes. Costa Alegre is a slim novel. It takes place in 1937 and it takes the form of a diary of 15-year-old Lara Calloway. Lara has been whisked off by her mother, Leonora, to Costa Alegre, Mexico. They have arrived in a grand but isolated estate on the coast. It's in western Mexico. Leonora, Lara's mother, is a, an heiress and an art collector. Leonora has very little time for her daughter, Lara, but she has also whisked off a group of surrealist artists and brought them over from Europe to Mexico on the brink of World War II. So those artists have joined Lara and Leonora on this estate and in this grand house where Lara fights for her mother's attention and also struggles with her identity as an aspiring painter herself amongst this group of genius artists. The novel is based on the true life of Pegine, the daughter of Peggy Guggenheim. In real life, Peggy Guggenheim was able to help 
a group of artists escape Europe, but she brought them all to New York, and Courtney Mom, for her novel, chose to bring them all to Mexico. So the artists in Costa Alegre are all based on a, a mixed up and combined version of real life surrealist artists of the time period. So there are really two levels of this novel, two threads. One level is this point in history where we're on the brink of war and there's looming disaster and you can just feel the tension in the air. And the other thread is the story of a 15 year old girl writing her diary and what she's feeling uh, every day and what she's thinking about and what she wants to become and the attention she's longing for from her mother. So really her everyday thoughts and feelings. And all of Courtney Mom's uh, narrative choices really seamlessly blend these two threads together. So the thread of impending war along with the everyday thoughts of a 15-year-old girl. And of course there were 15-year-old girls in 1937 and of course 15-year-old girls had 15-year-old girl problems in 1937. And in Costa Alegre, the story of these 15-year-old girl problems are given the same importance and weight as the story of the impending war. The novel is structured as Lara's diary, and I could really sense Courtney Mom's joy in using this narrative form. It's so playful, and it uses all of the elements that you can imagine a 15-year-old, or I could imagine a 15-year-old girl using in their diary. So there are daily entries about, about what Lara is doing and what all the people around her are doing. Each day is labeled by the day of the week in Spanish because she's trying to teach herself Spanish she's really without a tutor or any kind of formal education in this place. So she's kind of trying to teach her these things and, and keep herself occupied. And sometimes she even forgets the day of the week and that really amplifies this out of time feeling of isolation and boredom. There are also lists throughout that Lara is making. She, has, she lists the words for her mother or chapters she plans to read from basically the one book that she has. Early on there is a, a list and description of all of the artists that are staying in Costa Alegre with Lara and her mother and she orders this list in order of which artists she likes most to which artists she likes the least. And this is great because it, it's something that a 15 year old girl would totally do in their diary. But as a narrative device, it's brilliant because in one go, you get a description, a very natural description of all of the characters, what kind of artwork they create, a physical description, and what Lara thinks of them, all in like a paragraph. And it's so smart to lay it out in that way, but that it also fits the structure of the book. That would be something you would do in your diary. It's also really great because later on in the book, a character is introduced named Jack, who's another artist. The production of Jack is great because it adds movement to a novel where there's not a ton of of plot, but also because he's not in the, that initial list, you're not sure how Lara feels about him, which mirrors the fact that she doesn't know how she feels about him. And so as a reader, you aren't sure what you're supposed to think about him or how you're supposed to feel about him. So we're trying to figure out his story just as Lara is trying to figure out his story too. There are also sketches, which is probably one of my favorite parts of the book. There's sketches um, that she does while she's practicing Spanish. There's a beautiful drawing of Lara and her brother cliff diving. There are letters that she writes and drafts to her brother, to her friend back in Europe, which we assume she never sends, but it gets you get a sense of the people who are absent from the novel but are still part of her life, but aren't characters in this particular place and time you get a sense of her backstory with those characters. There's also a significant amount of white space, which fits the diary format perfectly because some days you have more to write than others, but it also gives the book a really visceral feeling of, of silence in this space that's punctuated by moments of activity and life and sound and color. And Lara really spends a fair amount of her time in Costa Alegre alone, but it suddenly then she's surrounded by these artists who are doing all sorts of goofy things. Um, and the white space helps convey that. 
So Courtney Mom has mentioned that Costa Alegre is based on a real place in Mexico called Costa Carreas, which she renamed Costa Alegre and fictionalized for this novel. So in the novel, Costa Alegre is lush and beautiful, but it's isolated and dangerous. The ocean is very treacherous. They aren't allowed to swim in it. There are jaguars and snakes and all sorts of dangerous creatures. There is little to no communication with the outside world. So war is coming, unimaginable horrors are coming, and the setting helps heighten that feeling of dread and anticipating doom, even though the characters are, are rather oblivious to it. At the same time, Costa Alegre really mirrors what's going on in Lara internally. In an interview with Deborah Kalb, Mom explains that Lara's material comforts come with no sense of safety or emotional support. She's surrounded by predators, both animal and human. And in another interview with LA Review of Books, Mom says that writing about such a wild place took a lot of restraint, actually, that to write about it feels kind of like the opposite of being there. When you're there, um, you're overwhelmed by um, sensory input, but to write it, she really had to restrain things. And how I read that was that she needed to hold a lot back in order to keep the narrative focused. So distanced from the increasing danger and peril in Europe, these artists in this setting are frivolous and goofy. And in an interview, mom called them, um, they were displaying a joyful negligence in the face of impending doom. As I considered this aspect of the novel, I wondered if the character's frivolity poses a, qu a question of whether art itself is frivolous in a time of war and destruction, in the time of, the, of loss of human life, or in times of extreme hardship or peril. Art is not a basic need of survival. Still, you can imagine there are those among us, like Leonora, who in the face of destruction would be desperate to keep art and artists themselves safe. Both the physical artwork itself, and in fact, Leonora is desperate throughout the book because she has a ship of artwork that she's shipping over from Europe and she's desperate for it to arrive in Mexico. And she's also saving the potential of future art by bringing the artists to this place as well. And art making seems like an add-on to life. It seems like maybe bonus points. It's also one of the most spectacular achievements we have as humans. So by saving artists and by saving artwork itself, Leonora is perhaps saving a key element of humanity from the destruction of war. And maybe art is one of the parts of human existence that makes our time here worthwhile. But it's even more complicated than that, of course, in this novel, because for Leonora, it all, it all goes back to the individual. For Leonora, her worth in the world seems to be measured by her taste and by her connections and by finding the next big thing and the next new artist. And so she has a lot of her self-worth self tied up in these connections and these phys physical objects. So by losing them, she is also losing a part of herself. So it's, it's a little more perhaps selfish. In a way, she's saving herself or saving the part of herself that she thinks the world values. The novel is very restrained, but Mom does a great job of choosing the perfect details to reveal character. And one of my favorite moments is on page 112, when Leonora lifts her skirt just a little bit and twirls her toes at another character. Nothing really compares to a single movement precisely worded to capture a character on the page. And there are also great moments where we see inner Lara, what's going on inside Lara. So on page 80, uh, the character Jack is pointing out glowing comb jellies, um, like jellyfish, out in the ocean. And Lara doesn't see them at first. And she writes, it's always made me nervous looking for something that someone already sees. It's like you have to find it quickly, lest they think you foolish. And is that odd sensation while they are waiting for your eyes to capture what theirs have already seized. I love moments when a writer captures a feeling that I know I've felt a hundred times before, but I've never actually identified with words. That was one of those moments. 
I can imagine Lara's heart fluttering as she's searching for those comb jellies out in the ocean and she can't see them. And on a deeper level, kind of an analogy of being a teenager among adults who know things that you can't yet understand, or to be a novice artist among geniuses like Lara is. Or in another setting, it's kind of like how I felt as a new mom whenever I was around experienced mothers. Um, there's just a sense that that they know more than you and that you're trying to prove yourself as well. And there's such anxiety in being in that position. In interviews, mom has mentioned that writing in this diary, diary form was really freeing, but then when it came to editing, it was a little complicated because there are things like grammar errors or syntax errors that she incorporated on purpose that were difficult uh, when it came to the editing or copy editing process to stand up and defend and say, no, that's there for a, a reason. Um, there were also questions like, well, would you use italics in a diary? Well, no, you won't, wouldn't because you're, you're probably writing it by hand, so you wouldn't write in italics. And I love those kind of details, you know, what actually goes in not just to the writing the story, but placing the words on the page. What are the decisions that need to go into placing the words on the page? It's so fun to think about. I also really loved reading about mom's uh, historical research for this novel. She had a process that she described in a few different interviews that I am 100% going to steal. She would do her research and she would every little tidbit she came across that was interesting, she wrote down in a notebook. And when she finished the notebook, she went back through, she filled it all up, she went back through and highlighted everything that was interesting enough on a second time through. And then she would continue doing research and fill up another notebook and she would highlight, go back and highlight the interesting stuff once she had written everything down. And then she would take those highlights and transfer them to another sheet of paper. And then I think then take that again and highlight what was most interesting from the next level of transcription. She said she used big, big, big sheets of paper to do this. And by that time she had written it, I think like three times. And by that time she had so memorized all of these details that she was actually, and she had absorbed them she was actually able to sit down and pretty much just write the book all the way through um, because she had absorbed those historical details and absorbed the things she most wanted to use in the novel. And I think that is brilliant and it's that the tactile repetition of writing that I think helps me learn and absorb information. So I think I'm gonna give that a try, but I love reading details like that of how writers actually do their work there are also other, what I think, I propose, I wonder, are kind of winks to other writers or maybe to the writer herself within the novel. And those are some of my favorite things to read. On page 28, Lara writes out, what, what I wish for my own paintings. And I had an, a writing instructor once, um, or maybe it was a literature instructor who said, anytime you see artwork mentioned in a, in a piece of fiction, you can assume that the writer is thinking about their own art of writing itself and you can replace, like in this instance, you could replace paintings with writing. And you can, it's a little insight into how the author views her writing. And in this section, Lara writes that, I would like for my art to be freer than it is now. I always feel like I'm coloring inside the most childish lines. And then later on she says, I have been told that I have talent, but no one says I have a gift. And again later she says, that's what I want, to make something truly beautiful, to make something that stays with you in that upsetting way. And you could see how Lara would feel that way about her painting, but you could also see how a writer would feel that way about her writing. But my absolute favorite wink to the writer, favorite, and I really hope that's the case and I'm reading it correctly, because if so, it's, it made me laugh so hard. Um, on page 179, Lara writes, tell me if there's anything worse, anything more horrible than a total inability to plot things. And of course she's talking about, she's plotting something she wants to do. She, she, she's not talking about plotting a novel, but the minute I read that sentence, I, I laughed, I thought immediately of plot in a novel and how difficult it is 
to write plot. So the two threads that I mentioned earlier, the thread of looming war and the thread of everyday life of a teenager come together so beautifully in this novel. Life and history always run parallel to each other. When you're living life, you can't see the history that's forming all around you. And then once a life has been lived, future generations look back and they can see the history, but they lose the view of the individual lives. And it's storytellers who bring the two together so that we as readers can experience an individual life within the context and story and painting of a bigger history. So just published this May, also by Tin House, is Courtney Mom's memoir, The Year of the Horses. The Year of the Horses is about a year in Courtney's life where she returned to the sport of horseback riding and took up polo um, after, third, I think, 30 years of a hiatus from horseback riding. She had ridden horses when she was a young girl, but hadn't been around horses for about three decades. And it's also about how contact with horses really helped her tackle a period of deep depression and insomnia in her life. Uh, but it's also about motherhood and it's about marriage and it's about how the self as a writer and the identity as a writer interacts with the other identities of motherhood and a spouse. And it's pretty funny too. Um, being funny is probably the highest praise I can give a writer and both Costa Alegre and The Year of the Horses have a lot of humor in it. So that is a big win in my book. It opens with a scene that is extremely familiar to me. Courtney Mom is struggling with her daughter in an epic battle over wearing socks. And in fact, this opening scene caused me so much anxiety that I had to put the book down for a few days because it was so true to life to me. The struggle over socks is real. And even though uh, Courtney Mom's life is very, very different from mine and her childhood was pretty different from mine and her family life is different. I can't really remember the last time I read a book where I saw myself mirrored so well and I saw myself in a lot of the pages. And it's partly because we're around the same age, so we grew up at the same time, so a lot of the references to her childhood, the cultural references, were very nostalgic for me. Um, but also a lot of her reflections on marriage and motherhood really felt true to me and really reflected my experiences with both marriage and with motherhood. So Courtney Mom has a great piece in Poets and Writers about how she shared this memoir with her family. And I always love to read interviews and pieces by authors that come out around the time the book is published because it helps me get more context because I'm not just interested in the story. It's, it's, since I'm a writer myself, I am interested in the entire context of, of producing a book. While I don't anticipate writing a memoir, um, I did find it really interesting um, how Courtney Mom shared that she was so anxious about sharing this with her family because she assumed that she would be taking a defensive position and that she would feel a lot of defensiveness over the choices she made in the memoir and that she would have to defend a lot of it. But in fact, it sounded like it, it served as a moment of connection between her and her mother in particular. So I recommend seeking that piece out. It really shows how sharing the memoir with her family allowed her to deepen the memoir because it allowed her ex to explore the vagaries of memory. So some of the details that she remembered as a child, she kept in the book, but she was able to then say, well, and then my family, you know, explain that this is what actually happened or this is how my family remembers it. Um, and so it, it actually served to, to deepen and complicate the memoir. And I thought that was very cool to, to know. Reading this uh, soon after reading Costa Alegre was also a very rewarding experience for me. As Courtney Mom points out in the memoir, she grew up in a very wealthy part of the United States and she goes into a lot of the, the privileges that she experienced as a result of that. And Lara in Costa Alegre also comes from an extremely wealthy family and though Courtney Mom wasn't located in the wild jungles of Costa Alegre, Mexico on the brink of World War II with a bunch of surrealist artists. 
like Lara, Courtney mom was navigating very difficult emotional family circumstances from a very young age. At the very least, maybe it's getting a kind of a behind the scenes look at Courtney mom's life and childhood. So it's possible to imagine the mind that created the character of Lara and maybe see behind the curtain a little bit some of the impulses that the author had that would inspire her to create the character of Lara and also give Lara a voice through her diary and through the novel. There are countless novels like Costa Alegre that use a diary format as the narrative structure of the story. But I wanted to bring out two of my favorite novels that I uh, more or less worship <laughs> that are, while not necessarily diaries, they are narrated by characters who are creating a document of some kind. So the first one I have is Women Talking by Miriam Taves. The narrator is August Epp, and he is taking the minutes of a meeting of Mennonite women who are there meeting in the attic space of a, of a barn, and they are discussing the next steps that they need to take as the women of this community after it is uncovered that the men of the community have been or some of the men of the community have been drugging and raping pretty much all of the women in the community. And the women who are meeting in the barn have tasked August Epp with taking the minutes of their meeting. And so that is the novel. Um, and it's interspersed with his own kind of journal-like or diary-like thoughts and feelings. And it is brilliant. And though it is, it is intense, the topic is intense, there is a lightness and a hope, a hopefulness really, that I have encountered in very few other novels. It's, it's one of my favorite books. And then also we have How to Set a Fire and Why by Jessie Ball. And this is the story of Lucia Stanton. She's a teenage girl who lives with her aunt um, because her father has passed away and her mother is in a mental hospital. And Lucia is a brilliant young woman um, who is also extremely troubled. And it's the story of how she comes to join the Arsons Club, uh, the Arson Club in her high school and eventually writes a manifesto, an arsonist manifesto or a, a guidebook um, on how to set a fire and why. And that is what is the novel, is her her guidebook on, on how to set a fire. And it is devastatingly sad and devastatingly funny. Lucia is one of my favorite characters. This book is brilliant as well, and I highly recommend it, um, but also just a great example of a, a document that turns into a novel. So there you have it. Many books from Tin House, two incredible books from Courtney Mom, two other incredible books with amazing narrators. Now I'm gonna go read a book and I hope you go read a book too. See you later.